Hello. The session on changing dynamics at the Indo-Pacific and South Korea's multi-layered complex strategy. The session has been organized by the Korean Association of International Studies. Welcome. As you understand, the Indo-Pacific region uh, is an area where we see both competition um, as well as cooperation. Also, in terms of regional cooperation for the Republic of Korea, we need to uh, broaden the diplomatic horizon and also to increase cooperation with countries in the region. So we have five presenters as well as five discussants to talk about our policy direction uh, for the Indo-Pacific strategy for Korea, and we will also look at various uh, Indo-Pacific strategies that are taken by the countries in the region and what, we, what should be the right response strategy of the Republic of Korea. We will have a very in-depth discussion in the regards. And also the Indo-Pacific region is a place where we have new and emerging uh, issues arise, rising. So from the new uh, diplomatic landscape uh, point of view, uh, we will try to understand uh, different dynamics at play. So I hope that you will have a very useful time. We look forward to your very active intervention. And we don't really have a lot of time, so the presenters and the discussants, their CVs are not going to be uh, discussed or introduced. So we're going to begin with the first presentation 
Professor Kim Young Shin from Ina University. The presentation uh, will have to be finished within 10 minutes, and also for the panel discussions, five minutes will be given to each one of them. Hello, I am Kim Young Shin from Inha University, uh, Department of China Studies. I will talk about China's Indo Pacific strategy among the countries in the region. Uh, if you look at China's Indo-Pacific strategy, well, the strategy itself came from uh, the United States, so we may not have a corresponding strategy in China, but nevertheless, we try to understand China's perception of the Indo-Pacific strategy and how they're trying to respond to such uh, different strategies. First of all, the Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States has been responded to uh, by China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative. So they believe that the Indo-Pacific strategy of the U.S. is a response to the China strategy. So there are a lot of confrontations or there are a lot of possibilities of a standoff between the two uh, major powers when it comes to the strategy. And if you look at the graph on the right side, that's Chinese um, scholars uh, that have uh, looked at the development of the Pacific strategy, CNKI, uh, which is China National Knowledge Infrastructure. This is a database of important papers, just like DBPL or KIS. That's a knowledge infrastructure that we have in Korea that's uh, similar to uh, what we have here. So we're trying to look at the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy, uh, the related papers that have been registered, uh, 14 until, until 2017. And with uh, Indo-Pacific strategy becoming more concrete, afterwards we have uh, 47 papers in 2018, 76 uh, papers in 2019, as well as 29 papers registered into the database in 2020 that many Chinese uh, scholars are also closely watching the development of the Indo-Pacific strategy over the years. And second characteristic here, now the core of the Indo-Pacific strategy is that uh, they're trying to gain dominance over the maritime uh, power. And the United States is now trying to uh, partner more closely with countries in the region uh, under the free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, rather than um, opening and cooperation, uh, China is saying that this is the strategy uh, that, that is trying to use the force to change the status quo. For example, Wang Yi, a foreign minister, on the 22nd of May, had a foreign minister's meeting with Pakistan and had a, a joint press conference, said that the so-called Indo-Pacific strategy implemented by the United States is under the a slogan of freedom and openness, but this is actually to contain China and also trying to put all the uh, countries under its hegemony. And after its party conference, they're trying to move away from direct confrontation with the United States, but they're also uh, looking, uh, China is also looking at this as a force that is trying to uh, trigger geopolitical conflicts in the region that it is trying to mobilize its forces uh, among the regional countries. Uh, the third characteristic is that uh, there is a stronger influence on Taiwan. Taiwan, For example, the president uh, of Taiwan uh, released a statement welcoming the Indo-Pacific strategy of the U.S. and Taiwan wants to play a more prominent role in that regard. And within the Indo-Pacific uh, Command, or oh, oh, the division, they try to put in place a division for the Indo-Pacific Affairs, and Taiwan is showing a very uh, nimble movement uh, towards responding to the U.S. strategy. And China is now exactly not really sure uh, where to draw the let, red line as for its intervention uh, in the Indo-Pacific strategy. So let's take a look at the current status of the Indos, uh, China's Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, they have uh, major frameworks that they have to look at four uh, different relations with major powers and three hotspots. Four major powers including relations with the United States, India, Russia, and Japan. Three hotspots include South China Sea, the Korean Peninsula, as well as border uh, areas between India and China. So four major powers and three hotspots. Uh, they're all included uh, in the Indo-Pacific strategy as well. So China 
동맹국에 과도하게 의존하고 있고 It's basically saying that the US in the Pacific strategy is overly reliant on allies and it is not really generating a lot of economic performance uh, unlike the one belt one road initiative so it is trying to uh, discount uh, the Indo-Pacific strategy and One Belt, One Road and Indo-Pacific strategy are the actual concrete realization of geopolitical and geoeconomic competition. And for the areas that the Indo-Pacific strategy is trying to cover uh, by the United States, China is now using the terms such as Asia-Pacific and South Asia. 나름 제가 보고서에서 말씀을 드리긴 하였지만 아마 시간 관계상 그 내용들을 I will not be able to go into the details um, of the report. And I will talk about the implications to the Korea's foreign policy. First of all, current status of the Asia Pacific strategy. For China, China is trying to come in uh, to address the weakening influence of the United States in the Asia Pacific region. They are taking the hedging strategy, not the bandwagon strategy that the United States is unable to create uh, any regional uh, powers. And China wants to take a more constructive role to fill the vacuum that has been left by the United States. Next is South Asia. There are four different features uh, when it comes to the geopolitical structure of South Asia. Uh, that there is both uh, geo uh, geological importance and security weaknesses. There is uh, asymmetry as well as imbalances in terms of structure, power. There are also terrorism and national extremism that's leading to security issues. Uh, there are also South Asia strategy and strategic competition among countries outside the region. So they're trying to, for example, strengthen the security and at the same time and also to form some economic um, alliance with the countries in the region. What about with South Asia? India would be an important country for China. Uh, the relations with India has been worsening due to conflict over the border region. It is because the United States uh, is trying to embrace uh, India to increase the strategic position of India and to encirculate uh, China that has led to the changes in the Indo-Pacific strategy. That is actually becoming a, a very important um, opportunity uh, for the United States. Now, China is trying to secure uh, credence and reliability uh, with the neighboring countries in order uh, by generating some uh, performance or results from cooperation. So what are the implications for Korea's foreign policy? First of all, over the long term, China is going to strengthen its position and trying to be uh, friendlier towards neighboring countries. And in order to respond to the containment policy of the U.S., China will take different approaches. And Korea will also have to be very innovative uh, in its foreign policy as well. And Korea also needs to come up with a countermeasure to deal with the Chinese, uh, Chinese attempt to change the status quo by force. Just like the United States is doing, we need to come up with our own countermeasures as well. Now, uh, because the current U.S. strategy towards China is not decoupling, uh, we have to actually focus on recoupling rather than decoupling. The second point, in terms of the implications for Korea's poli uh, foreign policy, uh, rather than we have a single forum, it is going to be custom-tailored to potential, and there is going to be a lot of um, uh, mini lateral consultation mechanisms in the region. So what Korea needs to do, it has to focus on safeguarding its values and at the same time has to be shopping uh, for mini uh, lateral uh, regional initiatives to redefine the values ourselves. And also in terms of our partnership with the United States, who is a party planner, we have to specifically point out what public goods that the United States can provide to Korea and has to be aligned with our national interest. 
And for uh, allies and partners around the United States, there's also a cost burden issue that we have to uh, think in consideration. So there are interests and values uh, that are at conflict, which is quite inevitable. So cost would have to be burdened amongst the partner countries by actually being more actively engaged in multilateral cooperative initiatives. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kim. Thank you for finishing your presentation on time. So the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy and China's response to that, uh, I think that is driven mainly by Belt and Road Initiative, BRI. But in terms of quality and quantity, uh, BRI has gone through some changes. And what does it mean in terms of responding to the uh, U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy? I think we need to have further discussion on that point. Now we're going to go to Japan. Uh, Japan's Indo-Pacific strategy and Korea strategy in regards. So, I am going to be discussing Japan's Indo-Pacific strategy. The first point that I want to make is that uh, there are many countries, not just Japan, who are interested in Indo-Pacific and even the U.S., China, Japan, ASEAN, as well as other countries such as the UK, France, and the EU, they know that there is a strategic importance in the Indo-Pacific region. So when it comes to the Indo-Pacific strategies, many strategic documents have been announced by various countries. So this is something that I need you to um, keep in mind. This means that there is an importance of connectivity to economic vitality of the Indo-Pacific region. So in that sense, we need to see that there are ample economic opportunities available in the Indo-Pacific region and many countries are interested in using these opportunities. And at the same time, not only the opportunities but also risks and challenges are emerging in the Indo-Pacific region. So strategic competition between the U.S. and China is being, engaged, is being staged in this region as well. And at the same time, as competition is intensifying in the region, many countries are forced to take side between the U.S. and China. In addition, we need to also remember, of course, we're going to have a full-fledged panel discussion, but in the Indo-Pacific region, we have new and emerging security threats in this region as well, including natural disasters, uh, climate responses and cyber threats and terrorism and the pandemic and health risks. So these new and emerging security threats are expanding in the Indo-Pacific region. So at the regional level or at the global level, we need to respond to these new security threats. Given that Japan has been interested in uh, the Indo-Pacific region for these reasons. but. When Japan is pursuing an Indo-Pacific region, there are certain characteristics. First of all, Japan is promoting a free and open Indo-Pacific, FOIP, and this is something that gives us a clue as to their fundamental strategy. So there is increasing complexity in the region, and by setting the rules-based and norms-based order, Japan argues that we can manage the region better, and at the same time, when it comes to adjusting the level of response to China, Japan is trying to reduce its reliance on China in many domains so that these are the key priorities for their Indo-Pacific strategy. So there have been many changes along the way, but now they're promoting a free, open Indo-Pacific, which is also called FOIB. Now the FOIB is, has been formulated and at a high level, we can also see that there have been some fundamental shifts and changes in Japan's foreign policy strategies. Since the 1980s, Japan wanted to become a normal state, and in 20, 2007, 2008, under the Abe administration, they revitalized this notion of becoming a normal state. So this notion has gained traction in recent years, and here, what they want to do in terms of diplomacy is that they are a large economy, but at the same time, they are still under threat, and they're thinking how to utilize their situation in a strategic manner. As you know, in 2010, 
uh, Japan's GDP uh, or China's GDP became larger than that of Japan. So Japan is no longer number one in terms of its economy in the region. So this is a strategic dilemma that is reflected in its Indo-Pacific strategy. And as with this economic status change, Japan is trying to pitch itself as a peaceful country, as a maritime power. As you, you may know, Japan's Indo-Pacific uh, strategy goes back to 2007 when Pre uh, Prime Minister Abe visited India. There was this notion of the encounter between the two, uh, two major maritime powers. And at that time, Prime Minister Abe said that we need to have a better connection between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. So that was a strategy initiated by Prime Minister Abe back then. So this was about a new aspect of Japan's foreign policy. And so in this regard, Japan has revised its Indo-Pacific strategy uh, along the way. Initially, they used the term Indo-Pacific strategy, but they didn't want to put too much emphasis on strategy because other regional countries may have felt concerned. So given such a concern, they wanted to reduce the color of this approach as a strategy. So they wanted to tone it down. So that is what happened in the past. So they changed it from a strategy to an initiative. And recently, the term initiative is not used any longer. So they just talk about free and open in the Pacific, FOIP. So that's all they talk about. And it is basically about establishing rules-based and norms-based regional order that is going to be inclusive. So that is what the Japanese government is promoting right now. You can see these uh, changes over time, and there were four stages that represent major changes in their approaches to the Indo-Pacific region. As you can see here, from 2013 to 2015, from 2016 to 2018, from 2018 to 2020, and since the outbreak of the pandemic. So Japan's strategies and approaches to the Indo-Pacific have changed both quantitatively and qualitatively, and there was some qualitative change and also conceptual change in their approach to the region. So the recent approach is free and open in the Pacific, and there are five specific goals that they want to pursue. It is basically about promoting cooperation with the regional, with countries in the region, and establishing rules-based regional order, which is also about establishing rules for maritime affairs, especially how to establish maritime governance. This this is a key issue that they want to use to promote cooperation with countries in the region. And this is ultimately about promoting economic integration and in expanding free trade in the region, which are very much aligned with Japan's national interests. And at the same time, free and open in the Pacific has to include another very important objective, which is about maximizing connectivity across the Indo-Pacific region. This is actually in a, a response to the Belt and Road Initiative by China. To be more specific, as China is implementing BRI, high quality infrastructure partnership has been uh, suggested by Japan. And this may be in competition with China's BRI, but in some cases, this may mean that they will have divided roles and responsibilities for connectivity in the region. And number four is that while promoting integration and connectivity, you will also need to strengthen cooperation with countries in the region, not just the co cooperation per se, but it is cooperation for capacity building. So this is a very important concept that has been prevalent in Japan so that they could improve regional governance, and they could deepen and expand regional governance. And what you can see in this map is that Japan is focusing on some of the key areas that have changed over time in the past, and they're promoting connectivity with ASEAN region. And it has two implications. First of all, as you know, 
ASEAN is the region that connects between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific region. If Japan increases connectivity with ASEAN, it will contribute to enhancing connectivity across the Indo-Pacific region. That is why ASEAN is critical for Japan. And based on the experience of enhancing connectivity with ASEAN, they can apply this model to other regions. So this is a part of their big picture. And when it comes to economic cooperation, you can take a look at this map. In the past, in pursuing FTAs, Japan was not very active in signing FTAs with less developed countries. But since Prime Minister Abe, they participated in TPP negotiations. Likewise, Japan has been active in not only TPP, but also economic partnership agreement with EU. And also, they have negotiated FTAs with other countries around the world. And in particular, under the Trump administration, they left the TPP. And then Japan was active in achieving the CPTPP negotiations and successfully launched CPTPP. So it shows Japan's leadership in promoting economic cooperation and free trade arrangements. And these are all part related to the Indo-Pacific strategy of Japan. In addition, within the framework of Indo-Pacific, they are also pursuing bilateral negotiations and bilateral relations. Of course, they continue to uh, nurture its alliance with the US, but also increasing connectivity with ASEAN and re readjusting their relations with Australia and uh, getting closer with India to keep China in check. In addition, there are many cross-sectional issues across the region. So Japan is active in diplomacy for these areas, including energy, high quality infrastructure, digital, and vaccine. And as you can see in this table, Japan's vaccine diplomacy is focused on the ASEAN member states. And here, many ASEAN countries received vaccines from Japan. Of course, COVAX was a facility through which vaccines were distributed for countries other than ASEAN. But when it comes to bilateral support, Japan has been providing vaccine mainly to ASEAN countries. So given that, the final comment that I want to make is that so far, Japan has been promoting um, the Indo-Pacific strategy, their limitations, and successful achievements. Of course, in terms of the positive term, they were able to strengthen their leadership in the region. And this is quite unusual uh, for Japan. It was not an ordinary uh, case of leadership, but there were limitations. They still uh, put focus on its alliance with the US, and they are promoting vertical cooperation with developing countries. These need to be overcome in the future for better cooperation. So given that, what can we do? From We can find some common grounds between Korea and Japan. So when it comes to setting some rules-based regional order, we need to acknowledge that Japan is a leader, but then we are a like-minded country with Japan, so we can collaborate with Japan for these causes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the third presentation, which is about India's Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, Dr. Che Yun Jung from Sejong Institute will speak about India's Indo-Pacific strategy. Hello. I'm from Sejong Institute. I am Che Yun Jung. So, as Dr. Lee said about the Indo Pacific strategy, so Indo Pacific strategy actually came initially as an Indo Pacific strategy of the U.S. and seems that the U.S. has a leadership over that, but there is a variety of Indo Pacific strategies out there. So, it's not just the U.S. strategy, and it is not a strategy that we have to choose either uh, China over the United States or the United States over China. So against that backdrop, what I would like to talk about is the unique characteristics that Korea's uh, own Indo-Pacific strategy would have to undertake and what are some areas of cooperation with other countries in terms of implementing the Indo-Pacific strategy. I hope that my presentation would be useful in that regards. So why do we need to look at India's Indo-Pacific strategy? Let's first take a look at their diplomatic values, the country. 
2049, uh, China has a China dream to become a superpower. In 2047, uh, India wants to become a strong India to commemorate its 100 uh, anniversaries of independence. Um, it's a nuclear power, uh, three largest in terms of national defense uh, budget, fourth in terms of military power, and fifth in terms of economic power. Uh, the United States is also putting a lot of focus on its relations with India. Calling the India tie is really important for Joe Biden, Joe Biden and Quad G20, D10, and IPEF, which is West-led consultation mechanisms. India is a core member of these uh, architectures and at the same time is continuing its cooperation with both China and Russia. So what is going to be a strategy going forward for India? There are a lot of people wondering um, as to how that's going to be folded out, folding out. And it could be an opportunity and at the same, same time a challenge to Korea. So we need to take a very refined and calibrated approach. So India's Indo-Pacific strategy, what are some of the key features here? Now with U.S.-China uh, competition over hegemony uh, deepens, India wants to overcome its difficulties as a sandwich country, but wants to use geopolitical value uh, towards its advantage to become strategically autonomous. So it comes from the tradition of being a non uh, aligned country, but at the same time, it wants to keep uh, possibilities open to all countries, all partners. It seems that uh, there is a, a paradox, but anyway, a country is now taking the stance on strategic autonomy. So in 2014, India has been implementing uh, its Act East policy in a gradual manner. And so it came up with the Sagar Mala, uh, security and growth were all, re all in the region in 2015. And FOIP, uh, another version for FOIP, which is free, open, inclusive, Indo-Pacific. Uh, this strategy was unveiled in 2018, and India announced the Indo-Pacific's Oceans Initiatives in 2019. So the background for the announcement of these policies is that India uh, had a war with China in 1962 and doesn't want Asia to be led solely by China to become a more, more unipolar war, world. So that is why China wants to have the United States or India wants to have the United States involved in the process and wants to go along with the Indo-Pacific strategy of the United States. But at the same time, it doesn't want to lean towards any specific country in terms of its effort to become a, a hegemonic power, uh, creating a unipolar world. So it seems that it is taking the US side, but it's not necessarily on everything. So it is becoming quite autonomous. So f when other countries look at India, they believe that there's a lot of paradox, but not so uh, for India. Actually, India has been taking a very consistent uh, one policy. At the same time, wants to become a stronger regional power uh, so that uh, it can exert a greater leadership uh, for countries in South Asia, the Indo Ind uh, Indian Ocean, as well as Southeast Asian countries. And a lot of countries are now trying to decouple from China. And that vacuum uh, to be created, India wants to go in. So make India, digital India, uh, which has been in place since uh, 2015 or so, wants to develop India as a global hub or hub of semiconductors. So they're taking that uh, strategy to make India stronger. So IPOI, there are seven pillars here for India. I will not go into each and every uh, pillar here. So. This is really different from the United States strategy of Quad. There, India is talking about maritime ecology, security, resources, uh, science, technology, academic cooperation, disaster risk reduction and management. So there are very practical agendas that India is interested in pursuing. And it's India, uh, in India's Indo-Pacific strategy is also evolving, especially since the aggression against uh, Ukraine by Russia. Uh, India was not part of the condemnation uh, against Russia. It is continuing to import and actually expanding the import of the Russian energy. Also uh, signed uh, a, tr a trade agreement uh, with the uh, Russian 
uh, government for the rupiah and ruble. And after Quad Summit, uh, it also took part in the BRICS uh, virtual summit, for example, to expand cooperation in space with China and also to use data that is collected by the Indian uh, satellite and to share that with uh, Russia, Brazil, uh, South Africa uh, as well. And in New Delhi, uh, they're going to have G20, and then at the same time, SEO Summit will be held in 2023 as well. So India seems to be quite diverse uh, in terms of the spectrum of its strategy. But again, it's a very unique uh, autonomy that the government is focusing on to ensure as part of its uh, foreign policies. So moving on. So what do we need to know? So they're very focused on practicality and to become a super, uh, major power in the region. And what's the, uh, what's the Indian government specific stance on each area? In terms of a traditional security, their main target is to make sure to check against China's uh, expansion and remove or uh, its attempts to change the status quo by force. So they want to deter uh, such attempts. So uh, India has already signed a major military agreements uh, with the United States and also began two plus two talks with Japan and has called in four Quad members and to begin the combined military uh, drills in Malava. And it is also trying to modernize its military and has assigned um, early on uh, the, 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 the fighter jet, uh, the Rafale from France, and also in terms of non-traditional security, uh, MDA, um, the marine uh, domain awareness, as well as humanitarian support, all these other areas that they're very focused on, and they're carrying out cooperation in their regards. And in order to put in place the re relevant institution, uh, Iowa, uh, BIMSEC, SARC uh, architectures are put in place. Other than security matters, we also need to uh, be more interested in the economic security issues of India. For the past 10 years, India has not been citing any FTA as all, at all, but starting this year with Australia and UAE, it signed an MOU and also uh, the UK, Canada, and EU, which are the major OECD economies, they are now in uh, FTA negotiation uh, process. So their economic uh, influence is growing in the Indo-Pacific uh, region, that they want to have strategic partnerships. And also the IPAF, which is led by the United States, 14 countries are there, and India is one of them. Next slide shows the comparison of the um, IPF against other uh, policy frameworks. Now, the U.S. IPF, it's not a free trade agreement per se. It's not about market access. It is not about providing any specific immediate economic benefits to the member countries. But because of that reason, re uh, because of that specific reason, uh, India can take part in the framework without uh, having to worry about uh, other issues too much because they don't have to open up their market. They're also trying to compare their positions with other frameworks. And as for cyber security, uh, China uh, stole some information from the Indian vaccine company and some 20 Indian soldiers lost their lives uh, in the border conflict, and at the same time, there was a grid uh, attack, and China also um, attacked uh, the Mumbai network, uh, leading to blackout. So they want to strongly defend uh, their cyberspace. That is why they are now working very closely with the United States as well as, well as other countries to scale up their cooperation and emerging technology areas as well as cybersecurity and digital economy 5G. India wants to implement the digital economy, wants to become, has the largest amount of equipment, a number of equipment uh, in 5G. It is a, a strong market. But it says that India is going to completely exclude uh, China from the process. And also, India, a plus one strategy, wants to become a hub of digital. In October, 
uh, African uh, Efrin Akhtar, who is the Undersecretary for South Asia, uh, visited India, said that the United States is going to be a core partner for India in terms of semiconductor manufacturing capabilities and supply chains. Now, we looked at uh, India's in the Pacific strategy. So what does it mean for Korea in terms of implementing its multi-layer diplomacy in this region? India's Indo-Pacific strategies as well as other Indo-Pacific strategies have to be well understood by Korea. And Korea needs to first understand the main goal or the motive of such strategies. So not focusing more on real benefits and interests rather than values. And we have to be very practical uh, in terms of implementing our cooperation strategy as a result. So it should be diplomacy that underscores the actual benefits rather than value. There are some other recommendations that I am putting forward over here. So in terms of uh, independent uh, defense industry, uh, India is the largest weapons importer. 70 to 80 percent are coming from Russia as well as former Soviet Union. Uh, India is now trying to source from different countries. Now Korea is a strong uh, defense uh, power, so we can cooperate with India in that regard. And also for 5G, there's decoupling move. And for cyber battery and semiconductors, uh, we can pursue practical cooperation with the country. Yeah. Lastly, uh, when we pursue a multi-layer complex regional diplomacy, we have to focus on the following three things. We have to increase the connectivity to the Indians in the Pacific strategy with other strategies. Uh, they're not part of only Quad, but also they're in trilateral, triangular cooperation with Australia, India, Indonesia, the United States, and with other countries like Japan. So there are part of these uh, triangular cooperation uh, mechanisms. And so bilateral as well as triangular cooperation, we need to continue to uh, stack up these uh, layers of cooperation. There is also a variety of strategies and tactics in the Indo-Pacific strategy. We, ha we have to uh, take a niche approach to use any vacuum that is created and from a network's point of view to pursue our interests further and to use a structural whole. Next is focusing on practical uh, interests. There are many countries that we can work uh, closely with by issue and by agenda. Perhaps we can develop a matrix per by country and by issue so that we can pursue our uh, foreign interests further. I hope that we can go into that direction. And with that, I'm going to finish my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Choi. So India, I believe, doesn't pursue any unilateral cooperation with any regional country or does not go into any uh, unilateral confrontation either. So that's actually a player that's increasing complexities in the region. Uh, we really don't have much time left, so let's move to the fourth presentation. We would like to hear from Professor Kim Sang-bae of Seoul National University. He's going to be talking about Indo-Pacific strategies and new technology security. Please go ahead. Hello, as has been introduced, I am Kim Sang-bae from SNU. In the Indo-Pacific region, one of the key issues that is emerging is new technology security. I'm going to talk about that. This issue itself is not very well known. So you may not be familiar with what it is, but I am going to do my best to explain this without PowerPoint slides. So when it comes to new technology security or emerging technology security, it is not just a technology that is emerging, but it is not just new, but it is emerging. Um, so it is taking form as it goes. So this field itself is not very clearly defined. It is not easy to put a boundary um, of this emerging technology as a concept. But at the same time, in the Indo-Pacific region, when you think about cooperation strategies, you can maybe discuss how we can cooperate in terms of cybersecurity. Uh, there are many hacking attempts and cyber attacks and threats. And so 
countries in the region can share systems and they can also deepen cooperation to prevent any illicit cyber activities, including money theft. And there's also psychological and cognitive well, well, uh, warfare in their cyberspace. So countries in the region need to work together to counter these threats, these emerging threats in the cyberspace. So such threats cannot be addressed by any single country. So they need to promote regional cooperation as well as global cooperation. And that's what's happening. For the past 10 years, there have been discussions on various forms of cooperation. I think that I can classify them at three levels, low level, mid-level, mid and high level. So at the low level, this type of cooperation is just uh, information sharing, sharing information on potential threats and recent attack events. So. The lowest level cooperation is just sharing information. This can lead to some sort of norm setting. The medium level cooperation um, actually is translated into specific action. For instance, countries can conduct joint cyber drills and exercises. They may engage in joint technology development or human resources development. They may offer joint training and education, not only in terms of technology, but also military preparedness. So the medium level cooperation involves specific actions. The highest level cooperation, of course, is some sort of alliance formation for cybersecurity. So the ROK and the US are discussing how to expand their alliance to include cyber domains. and. Also, there are many alliances led by the U.S. where they try to resolve cyber-related issues. So against this backdrop, what we can discuss is that as for cybersecurity, how can we promote cooperation in the Indo-Pacific region? Who will be the main actors? What type of cooperation framework can be envisioned in the, in the region? First of all, uh, just like conventional or traditional security threats, governments can participate in cooperation. So diplomacy, alliance, such formats are part of that. So mainly these are bilateral cooperation, in addition, minilateral cooperation. And so there, the scope of cooperation at the government level has been expanding. The second possible format is not just the government-to-government -government cooperation, but it includes various civil private sector stakeholders, and it's not just limited to a particular region or particular countries, but rather they can have rule setting and norm setting at the regional level. So some examples you can find to discuss the regional frameworks to cover cyber threats. And the third format is global governance framework or some sort of discussions on new rules and norms at the international organizations, or they may also agree upon some sort of global norms so that countries can respond to any illicit or illegal activities in their cyberspace. So these three forms of cooperation have been considered and discussed. And they can also be matched with the lower level, medium level, and high level cooperation. And for the past several years, in the, in the areas of cyber security, discussions have been underway in the Indo-Pacific region. So from the point of view of Korea, you can think about ROK, U.S. cyber security cooperation, Park Geun-hye administration and the Moon Jae-in administration and Yoon sung il administration. They have discussed ways to cooperate for cybersecurity between the two at the summit level. Furthermore, we can expand the scope of cooperation to other allies and partners. So Korea can take part in such discussions with partners and allies. And one good example is Quad or AUKUS or to a larger extent, Five Eyes Alliance is an example where cybersecurity is de dealt with. And in addition, Korea can work with India or Australia. There are bilateral cooperation initiatives between Korea and these countries. So when it comes to cybersecurity, 
it is basically cooperation to respond to potential cyber threats. So not every country in the Indo-Pacific region takes part in this. We mainly join in the framework of alliances led by the U.S. So there are some initiatives led by China for cybersecurity and developments have been made. And not necessarily a military or defense perspective, but in terms of technology, we can cooperate with China and cooperate with China and Japan in a more loosened format. Uh, I believe that there have been some discussions. Now, when it comes to East Asia and ASEAN, some discussions on cybersecurity have been made, and ARF, ASEAN Regional Forum, has been a key format where discussions on cybersecurity have been made. And of course, Korea has been participating in uh, the I ARF. And there's also Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation, or APEC, was another framework or another venue where cybersecurity was discussed. And there, a computer emergency response or thought was designed within APEC. And recently in ASEAN and also in ASEAN Pacific, these Asian bodies um, work with European counterparts. And we can also note that Korea is now actively engaged in NATO-led activities. And in that process, we can deepen cooperation with EU and OSC. So a lot of discussions are underway for further cooperation. Now, uh, to expand our discussion, we can utilize international organizations at the UN and also at multilateral frameworks. Discussions are underway to prepare for and ready and counter cyber threats. So there are so many discussions underway, which means that this issue itself is emerging and there are only discussions, but not many concrete results have been produced. In the Indo-Pacific region, when it comes to discussing this emerging technology security issue, it's not just going to be what I just mentioned, but also we can go ahead and cooperate for 6G and digital infrastructure. We can also engage in cooperation in the areas of semiconductor AI and also nuclear for energy and aerospace and military and defense related technologies. So in these areas, we may we, are, we can also pursue cooperation. But what is interesting is that the field itself, the domain is not well defined. and because it is about emerging technology and state-of-the-art technology, individual companies, they are not necessarily interested in cooperation because they are competing with one another. And when it comes to security, the US and allies and partners, they are now trying to form some specific formats, specific frameworks of cooperation. We will have to see how these initiatives will actually take concrete form. Finally, then, in these areas, what can Korea do in its pursuit of the Indo-Pacific region? How can Korea respond to emerging technology security? I would like to make three points. Well, all these issues are emerging, as I mentioned before. So these areas are very complicated, and they're all interlinked. And for each of these domains, our interest may be quite different. So we need to take a more holistic and comprehensive approach in covering all these related domains. Secondly, when it comes to these issues, we need to also understand the interests of our counterparts because their interests continue to change. Um, so there may it may not be easy to cooperate in some specific areas, but if we go a higher level, then we can try to connect between certain issues and certain domains. And finally, so in the areas of new and emerging technology security, what kind of stance do we need to take? We Should we um, approach this in terms of forming an alliance, or do we need to take a more liberal stance? So it should be more about um, setting norms and rules and regimes, or should we pursue more multinational or international approaches. 
So this is something that we need to discuss. Of course, each of these approaches is meaningful, but a lot of things are complicated and they're all interconnected. So we need to have a more strategic mindset. These issues are emerging and they're new and they're not easy to understand or comprehend. And so it is not easy to determine what kind of strategic position we need to take. But I'd like to argue that these emerging issues are going to be critical for the future of Korea. So this is something that we need to pay attention to and study. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Kim Sang-bae. And the final presenter is going to be about the U.S and it's um, in the Pacific strategy. So Professor Chun Jae-sung of SNU, thank you for the introduction. First of all, I'd like to apologize that I arrived late. So I was going to be the first speaker, but now I am the last presenter. I'm going to talk about the US strategy towards the Indo-Pacific. As Professor Lee sung Ju mentioned, the Indo-Pacific strategy, the concept itself was initiated by Japan. So that was 20, and then in 2017, President Trump took it, and then the U.S. came up with this idea of Indo-Pacific strategy. So it's been five years. And before that, President Obama had pivot to Asia and refocus on Asia. So they wanted to shift their diplomatic attention to Asia. So the Indo-Pacific strategy is a succession of the previous strategies and after even during the Obama the Biden administration the Indo-Pacific strategy has been maintained there have been many reports announced and now the US has um, its foreign policies and the Indo-Pacific strategy and their connections and many reports have been have been uh, published so the president Biden argues that the next decade will be the decisive decade because for the next decade. It's not just a competition between the U.S. and China, but it is a decade where the U.S. needs to mobilize st strategic resources and capabilities to regain its leadership. And also the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy is not just about strategy against China, but it is also about establishing a global order for the next decades. If China takes leadership, then the world may not. Uh, have liberal order anymore. So there is a sense of crisis and urgency. What the U.S. is trying to achieve using the Indo-Pacific strategy, there are multiple objectives. First of all, they want to ensure liberal global order, which will bring about national interests for the U.S. And secondly, the U.S. has weakened its power. It has seen its power weakened over the years uh, with the collapse of the middle power, uh, collapse of the middle class, and weakening of the manufacturing competitiveness. And they want to use the Indo-Pacific strategy to improve that. So they, they say that there's no difference between domestic and foreign policies and uh, no distinction between economic and security policies. And the third objective is to gain supremacy over China. And the fourth objective is to address some of the key um, global challenges, including non-proliferation and health crisis and climate change. So they want to put in place a regional mechanism to address these global challenges. So there are four objectives. The U.S. has a more comprehensive Indo-Pacific strategy because it is a global superpower and it is related to its global uh, strategy as well. So the first threat is, of course, coming from China. The U.S. does not just consider China as an enemy per se. That's the U.S. position. It's not just an enemy, but when you look at the national strategy report, China and Russia may cooperate with the U.S. because they were able to grow their economy within the framework of market economy and liberalism. So the U.S. still sees that there is potential and China has will and intent to restructure the global order. So the U.S. is keen on setting the right relations with, uh, with China. Of course, there are some economic confrontations, but also there are some other areas where the two countries need to cooperate. So the U.S. may not yet have a clear idea about how to deal with China. 
uh, because the stance of the U.S. government and the stance of private companies may be different. And there are some views uh, that are arguing for strong containment of China, while others argue that there should be more cooperation. So at G20, all these conflicting views have been presented. When you take a look at the core components of the Indo-Pacific strategy, of course, these are security components, because even if there is a conflict between the two, the U.S. has to maintain military uh, supremacy over China. This is a very important priority. In other areas, such as value and economy, there is competition. But if this becomes weaponized, then because the U.S. has strong nuclear power over China, they still have military capabilities to put pressure on China. So militarily, they want to continue their upper hand. And at the same time, the U.S. will continue to diversify its military alliances with allies and partners around the world, not only just the traditional military alliance, but also AUKUS and Quad. So all these military arrangements have been in place. And along with new technology development, a comprehensive deterrence strategy has been formulated. So now security strategies are uh, critical to the Indo-Pacific strategy. And then, as I mentioned, it is quite complicated to set a relations between the U.S. and China, as Professor Kim mentioned. Just because China, um, well, China doesn't necessarily go ahead and conflict with the U.S. all the time, and they want to be flexible in dealing with the U.S. There are domains where they can cooperate. There are other domains where they can compete. And on in May this year, um, Secretary Blinken talked about uh, compete, align, and cooperate. So they're going to strengthen cooperation with allies and partners, and they will promote cooperation with China in good sense, in a positive sense. But in areas where conflicts, where interests do not align, then they may conflict. They may um, have some tension, but they will make sure that there will be a guardrail so that there will be no military confrontation between the two. And China believes that as long as the U.S. well, the U.S. has been criticizing authoritarianism of China, but China also shares the view that the two countries need to cooperate in some areas. So it is an issue by issue approach. So in some of over some issues, they um, are kind of up against each other, but in other areas, they uh, can cooperate. Then going forward. This current competition between the two, will this become competition over hegemony? Uh, in the media, in many analyses, some define the current Sino-U.S. competition as hegemonic competition. This may be viewed that way from China because it is actually about who is going to be the ruling leader. And if you become the sole superpower, you should be able to have enough economic, military, and other capabilities. But the current international landscape is quite complicated. So there is this non-allied countries and third country, third world countries. Their positions are also going to be critical. So it's not just some something that can be determined by the relations between the U.S. and China, but rather the U.S. will have to get seek support from third country and other countries. So then let's move on to Korea's position and Korea's complex strategy. The U.S. and China are all kind of moving away from the existing world order, and they're trying to change status quo. And they will have to really make sure, and we also have to make sure that there will be no military confrontation. It's a long-term view, but also the U.S. and China seem to believe that uh, a new order has to be rules-based. And so there is an agreement between the U.S. and China. So even when they engage in competition, such competition has to be rules-based. Uh, it should not be self-destructing competition, or it should not be competition that gets them to a military conflict. And competition may have some positive impact. Um, so rules-based competition can produce some positive results. And competition can be, lead to better productivity, 
And so Korea has to guide and help these countries engage in rules-based competition. Thank you. So Professor Chun, thank you for limiting your presentation to an allocated time. These are very sophisticated and complex topics. So I know that it was too much for us to ask you to limit your presentations to 10 minutes. But then now I would have to ask um, something that is even more difficult uh, to the panelists. I know that you have a lot to share with us, but I hope that your remarks will be brief. Just focusing on some of the key aspects, so I'm going to give each discussant three minutes. First of all, Hwang tae yeon from uh, the Unification Research Institute. Hello, I am Hang tae yeon from the Korea Institute for National Unification. Thank you for the three minutes, the precious three minutes. I would like to make two comments. And this is actually about Professor Kim yong shins uh, presentation about China. So the 20th Party uh, Assembly would be a good area where we can understand what is happening with uh, China's foreign policy and to draw implications for us. Because it's uh, party congress actually reflects what is going on and it's domestic politics. They focus a lot on science, technology, and uh, security. So within the framework of competition with the US, that is where China has to focus on. And in terms of methodologies, that they will be continued to push for uh, BRI. So after the party conference was finished, what was really interesting is that uh, China uh, visited Vietnam as a first official state afterwards. So the whole leadership was there in Vietnam, so which symbolically shows that ideology-oriented uh, uh, cooperation with these countries that are actually supportive of the uh, Communist Party of China. And the second country that uh, Chinese leaders should visit is Pakistan. It is one of the key priority uh, um, countries in BRI. And after Pakistan, it was Tanzania, uh, developing economy in Africa. So what does that mean? China, uh, in terms of its uh, surrounding country diplomacy as well as developing countries, uh, has been emphasizing a lot on improving its diplomatic relations with these countries. And this is going to be important for China because it could go into that niche uh, space that would be created in competition with the United States. So when prime ministers from uh, Pakistan, uh, Tanzania and Pakistan came, uh, it was the uh, director of the, Internet, uh, the Domestic uh, Development Committee. So that means that there's a lot of push towards BRI, that the director's uh, level has actually been upgraded to be on par with the committee chairperson. And also the uh, world hotspots, uh, South China, the Korean Peninsula, as well as the border region. So here the Korean Peninsula issue will be very important for China. And what's interesting is that whether we can really see some changes or shifts in terms of China's perception of the Korean Peninsula, because it's a strategically important region for China. They call uh, what is the core interest. Uh, they don't officially call the Korean Peninsula as an area of core interest, whether uh, which is a different case for South China Sea. But if the Korean Peninsula is seen as a hot spot, and if core interest, that term is used for the Korean Peninsula, the position of China uh, would mean a change, that it could become a red line uh, for China. And in relation to that, uh, many Chinese uh, scholars are also having uh, a different uh, discussions that the priority for China, if we see that they want to see change in North Korea, not in terms of denuclearization, it could mean a lot in terms of their core interests in the Korean Peninsula. That merits a lot of attention from Korea in that regard. So who will cross the red line? Because we, of course, we want to see a consistent uh, policy of China uh, in terms of the uh, inter-Korean uh, inter relations and on the Korean Peninsula. And Korea will be put at a dilemma as to the countries that it would have to choose sides with. 
And uh, what is happening in China right now would serve as a good uh, key point in our policy options. So whether uh, China sees the Korean Peninsula as an area of core interest or not, uh, that is something that merits our attention. And many speakers before me uh, said that we're now facing a multitude of complex crises, uh, the same for the Korean Peninsula. And so that is why we have to take a multi-layer diplomatic, uh, diplomatic strategy to deal with these uh, different issues. And on top of that, I want to add the following point. So our basic stance or basic policy would have to be that whether at this crossroad, are we going to go for soft power uh, balance or are we going to be strengthening our strategic, uh, our alliance with the United States? Or will that be the case for the United States? From the point of uh, an attitude or approach, what I want to is say is that China is trying to be prepared for any emergencies. For example, there are a lot of variables, changes, and also uh, chal challenges and crises. What the Korean government has to do is to take a very cautious approach and has to prepare for any uh, contingencies. Because uh, hege hegemonic competition will continue into the future, so what should Korea do in that regards? It's not we have to uh, actually find our own middle ground. And there could be many options for us. This situation could continue and could deepen in the future. So we have to be fully prepared. That is the approach that we need to take going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we will invite the next panelist. Okay, so now I'm going to invite Dr. Yi Gite. So please limit your comments to three minutes. Hello, I'm Yi Gin Tae. I would like to comment on Professor Yi Sung Ju's presentation on Japan's strategy for the Indo Pacific. As Professor mentioned, the Japan's Indo Pacific strategy. Um, is aligned with existing foreign policies, but also there are some differences. Uh, they have this internal goal of becoming a normal state, and then there's confrontation with China's rise. So given these situations, Japan has been uh, had this all-out foreign policy, and next month their national um, security strategy will be revised and announced. So they have the traditional security components, but then there are also something new. Um, the new aspects, a strategic approach taken by Pri Prime Minister Abe, and also Japan wants to be a leader in the region. So from these perspectives, Professor Yi Seung Ju's presentation seems to focus on geoeconomic perspective of Japan. Of course, there are elements of traditional security, but also non-traditional security threats. and. There are cross-sectional approaches, including energy, high-quality infrastructure, and digital, which are uh, new and emerging issues. Then, traditionally, Japan has been relying on Japan-U.S. alliance for its foreign policy. But now, I think that there is a division of roles and responsibilities between Japan and the U.S. After the Trump administration, they put priority on America first. So. In the Indo-Pacific region, Japan, uh, Japan can play a bigger role. And as was mentioned previously, the liberal global order was not well pursued by, prime, by President Trump. And Obama talked about liberal global order. So by emphasizing liberal global order in the regions such as ASEAN, there may be some resistance against the US. So instead of the US, Japan can take a more proactive role in the ASEAN region and also in the Indo-Pacific region. So in that sense, there is a division of roles and responsibilities between the two. Now let's talk, think about Korea's Indo-Pacific strategy. In the triangular cooperation between the ROK, Japan, and the US, 
we may not just um, just focus on the negative aspect of containing China because there are new and emerging aspects of foreign policies of Japan, and Japan's foreign Japan's Indo-Pacific strategy carries much implication for Korea's Indo-Pacific strategy. So we're not necessarily keeping China in check, but we may engage with China and we may maintain open stance, which has been observed in Japan. So this is something that Professor Lee mentioned in his research and in his presentation. And finally, I would like to ask a question. Korea's Indo-Pacific strategy was just announced and Japan's Indo-Pacific strategy report will be announced next year. And I believe that the core principle is that in pursuing Indo-Pacific strategies in the past, Japan and Korea were in competition. But rather than competition, I hope that the two countries can engage in more cooperation. So cooperation has to be our key word. So then, in terms of Indo-Pacific strategy, I'd like to ask Professor Lee how Korea can cooperate with Japan. Thank you very much, Dr. Igite, for your discussions. Now let's move on to the third discussant. Professor Kumaru, you have three minutes. 안녕하십니까. 한국외대학교 인도연구소 라지 구마입니다. 저는 Hello. I have a question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Choi. So I'm going to make two comments. First, we must understand the role of China factor in India Indo Pacific strategy in a new way. Why? Because over the last two, three years, India's perception about China has drastically changed in a new way. The recent China's aggression in South, uh, in, in South Asia and also India-China border class in 2020 has drastically changed India's perception from China as a security concern to China as the biggest security threat. This is no, all, almost all policymakers and even recently even our uh, defense ministry has mentioned that India must prepare a policy to contain China, and India also must prepare a policy to deal with the future India-China class. So India's Indo-Pacific strategy is emerging as how to deal with China. This is the first strategy, I would say that. Uh, why I'm saying that? Because India already have uh, uh, activist policy, and before that, look at policy. But why India shifted to Indo-Pacific strategy, which is very close to the US Indo-Pacific strategy? Because now India is ready to join the US-led liberal order. There is uh, uh, so many evidence for that. India rejected Belt and Road Initiative. India recently also rejected to be part of China back, back uh, uh, RCEP. Uh, not only that. India is also deepening its military alliance uh, with the U.S. and also India is openly uh, a strengthening relation with Japan on Australia uh, and that is a recent two, three years that relation gone in a new way. My second point is that we must look uh, India's foreign policy uh, towards uh, Indo-Pacific in a new way and I will coin the term is uh, there is no country in the Indo-Pacific which have, of course, like US, Japan, all have Indo-Pacific strategy containing China, but also they are trying to reassure China that we are not going to balance in a very traditional way. So similarly, India is doing the same way. At the one way, India's strategy is purely based on traditional balancing strategy. But at the same time, India is trying to reassure China that, of course, we are not going to have that type of hard uh, balancing strategy that happened in the Cold War. But if you look at the big picture, definitely India is going to have a, uh, a very, very clear cut balancing strategy in the Indo-Pacific. So we need to recalculate China factor in Indo-Pacific strategy in a new way. Thank you so much. 
네, 쿠마로 교수님, 네, 좋은 토론 감사드립니다. Thank you very much for your discussion. Let's move on to the fourth discussion. We have um, Dr. Yoon Jung Hyun from the Institute for National Security Strategy. 안녕하세요, oh. As um, I'm going to comment on Professor Kim Sangbae, so I'm going to be discussing uh, his presentation. So today is the era of the emergence of new security threats. We have uh, terms such as new security threats and non-conventional threats and non-traditional threats. And these new and emerging security threats are not some partial threats, but these are comprehensive threats that are critical for our national and foreign policy. So these issues are not in the periphery, but rather they're core issues that need our attention. And also when it comes to cyber and emerging technology security threats, such threats are emerging mainly in the Indo-Pacific region. So in that sense, cooperation for cyber security was discussed at, uh, at the lower level, medial level, and high level. So the spectrum of cooperation was presented. And I believe that this is going to be a useful framework for our research. And what we need to pay attention to is that emerging technology security and non-conventional security, even though they are at the core of security discussions, even though they are core in our agenda, it does not mean that we should approach them from the lens of security only. As Professor Kim mentioned, at each layer, we may need to apply a different approach because they have different implications. In some levels, there may be some room for open discussions uh, when it comes to rules formation. But in other domains or other levels, we may need to solidify our alliances and more um, fixed arrangements. So there are many kinds of discussions underway, especially when it comes to cybersecurity and also for emerging technology security. There are talks about reshuffling and restructuring of supply chains. So these are rather dynamic discussions which will provide us with new opportunities. So we need to study all these issues at different levels and we need to take a more strategic approach. In particular, when it comes to cybersecurity, Professor Kim gave a lot of good examples, but uh, the IT supply chain issue has to be addressed as a security issue, not just a technology issue, but a security issue. So these issues are related to metaverse and online activities and industrial value creation in the cyberspace. So we have larger spaces for for cybersecurity and also larger risks and threats. So we not only need hardware preparedness, but also software preparedness in terms of security in our supply chains. And we need to put in place a mechanism for intelligence sharing so that we can better prepare for potential cyber threats. Likewise, just like cybersecurity issues, new emerging technology security, we need to have a more sophisticated analysis of different layers and levels and dimensions. And uh, the Indo-Pacific cooperation framework led by the U.S. was discussed. And what I'd like to ask for is to take a look at uh, many arrangements, such as AUKUS. They may vary in form, but they seem to be more focused on allies and partners. And, but then there are some other frameworks that are more open. So when we look at these different arrangements in terms of their tightness and closeness, we can examine them and understand their differences. So I hope that he can come up with better categorization of the existing frameworks for cooperation in cybersecurity and emerging technology security in the Indo-Pacific region. And uh, she can also discuss their implica implications and considerations for Korea in formulating its Indo-Pacific strategy. And finally, when it comes to responding to emerging technology security, we have this mindset of a middle power, and we can learn from what he mentioned. So especially when it comes to restructuring of the semiconductor supply chain, this is a very good example in point. 
As for semiconductor supply chain, Chip4 or FAP is an, an initiative to restructure the supply chain, and there's a term called technology alliance or technological alliance. So when we use this term, we have in mind that we may apply the security lens too much. This may actually limit um, to limit the extent to which we can um, act. So. Rather than emerging, uh, rather than being focused too much on that aspect, the security aspect, rather than just focusing on alliances, we can extend our scope to include more open frameworks and other platforms. And also, we should be smart in a way to avoid any negative impact and negative threats. So in other words, we need to have a more sophisticated approach. Dr. Yoon, thank you for commenting some of the important aspects of Professor Kim's presentation. These all require our thinking and our thought, uh, discussions. So you've actually waited for one hour and 20 minutes, and I'm so sorry to give you only three minutes. Uh, I am Kim Young Goo. I've been the neglecting uh, discussion, the executive director of East Asia Institute. Um, I have a commentation for Mr. Chun Jae Sung. I had a chance to work with uh, Professor Chun for research on Indo Pacific strategy, so I don't have much to say, but I'd like to make some points about the U.S. future Indo-Pacific strategy and theoretical implication and also uh, their implications for Korea. When it comes to Indo-Pacific strategy, NSS and NPR, you can find four key features. Uh, of course, there's competition against China and a blurred connection between domestic and foreign. And it says it's value-driven, but it's national interest-driven. And they're trying to strengthen alliances, network. And so if there's more emphasis on domestic politics, this means that uh, the changes in domestic politics may lead to changes in the Indo-Pacific strategy, especially after the midterm election. The Democratic Party did a good job. So this may continue. But I don't know how much of an impact it will have from the Republican input. So this is something we need to consider. And secondly, during the presentation, he was not able to cover. but. The U.S. into Indo-Pacific strategy, whether it's going to be successful or not. So we need to think about this question uh, with caution. He gave his evaluation. So it is rather about um, connection between um, investment and economy and also competition and confrontation. So there are a lot of conflicting ideas within the strategy. So some say that this may not be successful because there's this um, conflict of interests between the individuals and the group. So will China uh, fail? Will the US fail? So thinking about these questions will be interesting. And secondly, uh, theoretical implications. So the petty, uh, so hegemony and other theories on hegemony and power, well, it costs too much to maintain the status quo. And there is a much more hegemony rise. And China's rise will lead to a decline in the US. And that is a prevailing idea. But the U.S. took hegemony from the U.K., and um, he's, the U.S. has been winning against Japan and against Russia, Soviet Union. So will this continue? But the U.S. and the China, they cannot become a hegemony because there's so much public good that has to be provided, and not any single country can provide such large public goods. So in modern history, we may need new theories to explain hegemony around the world. So this is going to be an interesting research topic. And finally, what kind of foreign policy does Korea have to pursue? So his conclusion is not just um, the US, not just the China, but it has to be based on value and norms. But for the next five years or 10 years, China and the US, they try to engage in fierce strategic competition. So in that sense, value-driven foreign policy may not be effective. So in the short term, we need to think about uh, the kinds of stance that Korea has to take. But in the long term, if it's going to be rules-based or value-based, what kind of values do we need to promote? So that's going to be another imp interesting question. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. So we've finished our presentations and comments, but looking at my time, it's 4.10. But when you look at World, uh, World Cup games, I think there's that extension of the time. We, you give uh, additional time. 
for play. And using the power vested in me as a moderator, I'm just going to give some additional time for discussion, especially going back to the presentations, to look at Korea's direction for multi-layer complex strategy in the Indo-Pacific. I think there is a consensus on what we need to do in terms of a strategy, but how to. Perhaps that is one area where we could get your input on. And we look forward to your comments in that regard. Uh, each uh, presenter will be given one minute. Uh, Professor Chan. Thank you. These were wonderful discussions and wonderful comments. So these will help deepen and advance my research. And I would like to respond to two comments. First of all, the U.S. strategy against China after the midterm election, well, this is a very big political bipolarization in the U.S., so you may think that both parties are against China, but when it comes to the details, you may see differences in terms of domestic politics. Uh, which party is going to be stronger against China will take over national interests. So you may think that there is a consensus or agreement between the two parties, but uh, there may not necessarily be a substantial agreement between the two parties, and such political division may lead to overbalancing against China. So this is something that the U.S. has to be cautious about because it can be dangerous. And as you mentioned, when Korea pursues rules and norms, I think that rules and norms are different. Rules may not be based on value, but rules are some of the things that we need to all abide by for practical reasons, but norms are more about values. But then, once again, values and a practical, a pragmatic diplomacy to pursue national interests can also be a value that we can uphold. So just because we follow a value doesn't mean that we're not practical or pragmatic. So that's my view. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kim, Dr. Huang, uh, thank you so much for your comments. Uh, I wish I had more time to deal with um, everything you said, but let me just focus on two points. First of all, China on the Korean Peninsula, it stands on it. And if China looks at the uh, matters on the Korean Peninsula as a, a matter of core interest, what should we do? Uh, for scholars here studying China, we try to understand what Chinese uh, core interests are, but what are the uh, core principles that we have to follow in negotiating uh, matters with China? I think we overlook that. Uh, the Westphalia uh, sovereignty principles are interpreted uh, by China. Uh, so, for example, on the Korean Peninsula, uh, they say that uh, they're trying to actually take a different approach towards uh, the matters on the Korean Peninsula, but I think what they're doing is actually they're trying to uh, cross the red line. Uh, if they get too much uh, involved in the Korean Peninsula, uh, looking at the interest in South Korea as well as North Korea as their core interest that is actually crossing the red line. And we have to make that very clear uh, to China. So what side should we take on? Uh, Dr. Huang said that uh, China, we would have to be very prepared for any contingencies, that we have to build our capacity, and we have to prepare uh, for a new future in implementing our foreign policy. Not everything is actually determined by competition between the United States and China, but what is actually happening in the Indo-Pacific is that there are so many different networks, there are value uh, chains, and there are multi-layered uh, dimensions to that. So as a middle power country, rather than making a declaration on the path that we will be taking, we have to do shopping for our own interest. Rather than taking any, uh, taking A or B over the other, or being very black and white about the strategy that we want to take, whether it's ambiguity or clarity, we have to actually take the process of trying to find out the right path forward in the process. Thank you. Next. Um, 
Dr. Igite mentioned something very important, so it is my turn to respond to that. And what I can say is that uh, recently there were many um, issues and a combination of policies and industrial policies for domestic economy as well as uh, overseas um, or trade related industrial policies that are connected. So in Japan, something interesting is happening. So in the past, they had certain industrial policies, but now Japan is pursuing a new set of industrial policies. In the past, their industrial policies were focused on protecting their own industries, but now their new industrial policies were about maintaining and strengthening the ecosystems of the domestic industry. So the shift has been happening. So in that sense, their foreign policies are in connection with the new industrial policies. And one good example is that the TSMC hosting and uh, they provided more than 4.5 trillion yen of support, which was not um, feasible in the past. So now you can see a combination between new industrial policies and foreign policies and connecting different issues together. So in that sense, we can find a nexus between Japan and Korea for future cooperation. Now I'm going to invite Professor, uh, Dr. Choi yun -jung. Uh, Dr. Rajkumar. Uh, I talked about the India's uh, Indian government strategy and stance in, in the Pacific and also talk about China, that it is actually moving more towards a strategic uh, clarity from ambiguity. So thank you. Uh, I said India really focuses on uh, pragmatic interests. And I talked about connectivity, uh, multi-layer diplomacy, matrix, and so forth. So all in all, uh, as was mentioned by Dr. Chung, it's about practical uh, diplomacy and also value-based diplomacy. They're not actually at odds with one another. We're trying to provide a connection between the two so that we can have a full picture, complete a range of diplomatic uh, policy for Korea. Thank you. Finally, Professor Kim Sang-bae, thank you, uh, Dr. Yoon, for your comments. Emerging technology security, the concept is not defined yet. It is still an emerging area, so it is not easy. But the key question is to to uh, what and with whom and how. And in, for Korea, there are three options or three um, crossroads per se. So the first one is uh, we can put emphasis on the security framework so that we can bandwagon onto the U.S.-led alliance in the Indo-Pacific region. So that's one option. And the second choice is uh, focusing more on the regional framework. So within the Indo-Pacific, we can put focus on the ASEAN countries and uh, Asia-Pacific countries and even uh, collaborate with European countries through inter-regional frameworks. So in that sense, um, regional framework or regime can be formulated to address emerging technology threat. But the third option is a global approach. You can, we can participate in the process of establishing rules and norms and international um, guidelines on emerging technology. So these are the three options, but these are not mutually exclusive, but rather you can use um, a number of them together in combination to address the emerging area. As I mentioned, this is an emerging area. Likewise, our Indo-Pacific Indo strategy is emerging as well. So we can keep all of these aspects in mind in devising a better strategy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kim. So we've come to the end of the session. Through the presentations and comments, I think we were able to uh, draw a consensus to a substantial extent. And the United States, China, India are the regional powers here uh, in creating an order for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, their strategies were reviewed, and we were able to gain a better understanding of their strategies and also creating a new order in new technology area that was also reviewed. And we also talked about various challenges uh, that lie ahead, which are quite daunting as a region and as a country. Uh, we need to review the ASEAN strategy for uh, Indo-Pacific. And also in terms of issues, we need to understand the uh, changing order in the traditional security area, and also economic security, which is a new thing. How the regional order is being formed, how is that going to evolve going forward? That also requires uh, much attention. So we will need to conduct some research on this area. And to make our thoughts more concrete, uh, with that, I would like to conclude this session. Thank you very much.